team because we really liked it. So I'd like to introduce um, Anne Swain. Am I saying that right, Anne? Or is it Swan? Swan? Swain is right. That's right. right. Anne Swain from um, Sawmill River Audubon. And she is the executive director. And she's going to talk about their birding hotspots. And, you know, hopefully when things are calmer and better, I know some of us would love to go up north and, and see your birds up there. Cool. All right, great. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, it's, it's fun to do this, right? Just connect this way um, across the miles. Uh, and all of us interested in the same thing and, and birding in different parts of our country. Uh, so what I brought together for you tonight um, are some images, a few sounds, uh, different pictures of what we're focusing on now with birding, sort of the seasonal highlights and what, what, where do we go, you know, what are our hotspot areas too. And this picture is actually one of my favorite places to bird along the Hudson. It's uh, a grassland on top of a capped landfill at Croton Point Park and uh, we were thrilled this year to have dick thistles nesting there. How crazy is that? We don't usually get dick thistles in New York. Uh, but we have bobolinks and grasshopper sparrows there too so it's pretty neat. And then uh, come fall and winter there'll be harriers. Actually uh, kestrels are starting to move down the Hudson now. More about that. So here's a view across the Hudson River. Um, this is a three mile crossing at a shallow part with a Dutch name, Tappan Zee. Um, so I'm kind of kind of focused on the lower Hudson area for me, the Tappan Zee North. I'll show you more of that in a minute. Um, and I want to give a shout out for the credits. A lot of these credits are uh, from Sawmill River Audubon. Uh, the pictures are not my own. Okay, I use them from a lot of different places um, and uh, credited as needed. Uh, so I'm coming to you about 25 miles north of Manhattan. Um, Red Star is where I'm talking from now. Um, this sort of uh, uh, vase-shaped county here is Westchester County, it's called, and it's perched right on top of the city. The city starts right here at the border. Here's the Hudson River, and here's the Long Island Sound that opens up to the Atlantic coast. Okay, Down here is, is Long Island. And over here is New Jersey. <laughs> and over here is Connecticut. So we have this tri-state area, uh, a lot of water, and then you'll see all those green parts. There's a lot of forest actually here. Not too far outside of New York City is a lot of forest. There's some grasslands, uh, a lot of salt marsh, particularly along the Long Island Sound. So a lot of different habitats here. Uh, and just to put that in perspective, I'm going to wave to you from about 980 miles north northeast of you. <laughs> so that's fun too. Yeah, and so this is the highway, isn't it, down the coast that the birds are taking now. Um, so for me to get to the ocean, um, if I went the shortest route, I'd go out here to the shoreline of Long Island where there's a lot of good birding. Um, and that would be about, uh, that would be an hour drive for me to come up through New York and come out to here to Jones Beach. I just did that the other week, um, 40 miles to the Atlantic coast. But when I want to get a really good shorebird salt marsh fix, I actually go out to the Long Island Sound, um, to some shoreline here. And of course the shorebirds are moving now too. So a lot of the hot spots are concentrated around the water or up here in the forest or in some of the grasslands I'll talk about. Uh, so here's another look at that valley. Um, and uh, here's that bridge I showed you the picture of, the Tappan Zee Bridge. And actually from this picture is about 50 miles up. This is Croton Point right here. Do you see this peninsula sticking out into the Hudson? It's really an extraordinary birding hot spot in the Hudson Valley. I'll talk a little bit about that. The other thing that's a feature of our landscape are lots and lots of reservoirs, all of which which feed the uh, great thirst of New York City. And so there's all kinds of lands up here that are owned by New York City. New York City Department of Environmental Protection owns lots and lots and lots of land here and then just a little further north here is the Catskills um, to protect the watershed for the drinking water for New York City. So that affects bird habitat too, of course. All right. So here's why uh, we're pretty birdy here and why we're sharing a lot of the same birds, the pipeline, right? The Atlantic Flyway. Uh, a lot of those branches come together right here where I am. So there's a lot going on for fall and spring. Uh, right now, we're looking ahead to our wintering birds. We get a ton of waterfowl that come to the lower Hudson and spend the winter. Because the Hudson is tidal all the way up to Albany, 
uh, it stays open. You might get ice flows, but it doesn't really freeze over. So, yeah, um, what I look forward in October are the little buffalo heads. Kind of marks the fall for me. These little diving ducks. Um, and then in the spring, of course, we have those neotropical migrants that you know very well. And did you notice, right, during the spring, this was kind of a viral thing during our shutdown, our pandemic shutdown, people putting out oranges, which you probably have known about a long time. But for us in the Northeast, is just sort of something that's caught on uh, to see Orioles up close. So we have the nesting breeding birds, we have the wintering birds, and then we have fall and spring migration. Here's another picture of the bird richness here just the number of breeding bird species and you can see the lower Hudson is is really a diverse landscape and pretty good as well as uh, parts of the Adirondack and the Great Lakes. So what we look forward to um, as I said is this big movement of waterfowl uh, fall and spring up and down the Atlantic coast and the uh, Hudson River birds coming all the way down from Hudson Bay really and St. Lawrence um, and some spend the winter here in huge numbers, and one of my favorites is a golden eye, uh, the brant, the big sea goose, and then hundreds and hundreds of common mergs will be out in the lower Hudson throughout the winter. Uh, just a, a look at our context for Audubon too, you can tell there's a lot of people here. We actually have five chapters of Audubon in this one county, right? Uh, there's five more out on Long Island, um, there's one that covers all of Rockland, one that covers all of Putnam County, because those counties are a little less dense than, than Westchester is. So I'm based up here, kind of the northwestern corner. And Greenwich is very close. That's uh, I could obviously Connecticut over here, and their Audubon Center at Greenwich is just right outside Westchester. And so it's a big community. A lot of us coming together on that bird chat. These are the Audubon and birding groups from Albany uh, all the way down to New York City. It's nice, right, how people work together. Favorite sound. Do you have wood thrush nesting where you are? I don't think so, right? I think that's more of a northern forest bird. And um, when they return, and I think they uh, spend the winter in like Belize and Central and South America, but they of course pass by you. And that's always a sign for me of the of the spring woodlands coming to life up here is, is the wood thrush. And they uh, sing all the way into uh, August, and now they've gone quiet, and I, I think they're on their way south to you. Uh, but to have wood thrush, we need to have that deciduous forest with an understory, right? Things that grow from the floor all the way up, uh, tall shrubs, young trees. And that's uh, a real problem throughout the eastern seaboard up here in the northeast. Um, we have a lot of forest. It's pretty amazing. And this is a whole megapolis, isn't it? All the way down Baltimore, Washington, uh, Philadelphia, New York, and all the way up to Boston, this whole megapolis here. But there is actually a whole bunch of forests just outside the cities that have all grown up, um, all second growth forests from the uh, 1800s through now. But we don't always have the understory because of the deer browsing, and without that we won't have the wood thrush. So one of the things we struggle with is, is, uh, is another favorite. listening and looking for the thrushes. Isn't that a great song, Viviri? Um, and so yeah, characteristically, um, we look for the quality of the trees up here, what we're birding for. If we have 10 acres or more of canopy that touch, we might have a scarlet tanager. Um, since the 1940s, the suburbs of New York and New, and, uh, New Jersey and Connecticut, the trees have grown up, right, since World War II. And so now you have old forests right in the suburban area, which brings some infrastructure issues with above ground wires, etc. But also means that the pileated or pileated, whichever you prefer, woodpecker has really become much more common here and much more bold. If you look at old bird books, they'll talk about it being shy, retiring, deep woods. Well, that was a function of, of the age of woods. Now we've got them all over the Northeast, right in people's backyards. And of course, a big deal in the Northeast woods is, is the woods warblers. And I know you're seeing them move south, and we are just seeing some from Canada and northern New England uh, just this past weekend with the cold front, a big burst of new warblers moving. Some of these, though, actually nest here where we are, uh, worm-eating and cerulean in good dense forest, uh, oven bird if there's cover on the ground for them, black and white you know well, pine and prairie, which I always thought was the worst name warbler, but prairie used to mean openings in the woods. Right? And that's sure enough, they like edges. That was funny for me. 
So one of the things I do when I'm traveling somewhere or I want to learn a new area is I go to eBird and I check out the uh, bar charts. So you can see this is a look at our warbler movement in the lower Hudson. You can see we get these two big bursts in May and now it's starting August into September uh, of a lot of warblers that do not nest here. Right? We just get them in passage from uh, uh, eastern Canada, northern New England, the boreal forest. Uh, some we do have here, uh, and you can see the line go all the way across, red starts and yellow throats and such. Um, and the same thing is happening. So the other thing about the seasonal flow here is the sandpipers. And I know you guys are, were just talking earlier about the ones you've seen. Um, and that starts for us really in July. I put the line of where we are now, the red line. But of course, and they've already come to you, um, our movement of sandpipers started in July. Uh, the dowagers, uh, semi-palms. Spotted breed here, um, and greater yellow legs and willet breed here. Our willets have left. They're already by you. Most of the willets have, have left our marshes and they're to the south. Um, and uh, so you can kind of see that movement. Uh, and the woodcocks probably nest around here, but we mostly see them, look, we know when they're singing and dancing in uh, March and April at night. So here are pictures just from our eBird stream just the past week. So these are what our local birders have photographed here uh, over the past week. The turnstone is a hard bird to get on the Hudson River. Uh, Long Island shoreline, you might get them, but it's kind of neat. Solitaries, we get a lot of because they like those inland fresh waters, right? And wooded ponds. Spotted, there's a youngster with that spur some of you were talking about along the Hudson. Uh, Semi-palm is one plover we'll get on the rocks along the shoreline. And then the least have been moving for several weeks now. Um, I always think they're really darling, right? Really tiny little ones. So the other thing that's interesting is we have a really big saw wet owl migration through here, which was only really discovered in the last few decades. And a friend of mine, you can go to her website and read that, uh, Baddeley, Trudy Baddeley, has been banding them. Uh, she had nets up at Westchester Community College campus and some other places. And it's amazing how many owls are flying over our heads uh, that we didn't know about. So she has a lot of neat studies. This is a full-grown sawwood owl. And of course they've been banding in Cape May too and another friend gets to help down there. Uh, but what I really like is the seasonal flow is the hawk migration. And it's really quite something. Um, I just took this quick snapshot. Somebody needs to be muted I think. I took this quick snapshot from hawkcount.org and that has the count data and profiles for over 300 hawk sites. But you can see all the hawk watches in New York, and right here where we are in the lower Hudson, there's quite a few. And I'm gonna unmute now. Cool, you muted everybody else. No worries. Did it uh, come back? Yeah, it came back. I'm still talking. Good. Um, yeah, so the big beautios, uh, three major ones that we get moving through. Uh, tend to stay in the mountains more, right? Follow down the Hudson River ridges while out on the coast, uh, peregrines and the other falcons move more in numbers. Here's a great look. Isn't that a neat view? Now these aren't very high hills, but either side of the Hudson has ridges like this, made famous in the Hudson River School of Painting. Uh, so these aren't very high, they're about 800, 700 feet. They're very old mountains, very well eroded at this point. Um, but there's a view from the next bridge north, Bear Mountain, looking down the Hudson Highlands. And then on that New Jersey side, you have the Palisades, that rock formation. A lot of that rock was used to build New York City. And the peregrines are once again nesting on those rocks. So one of the hawk watches is at Hook Mountain. That's a big, and you get a 360 degree view all up and down the Hudson River. If you ever have a chance to get up there. And it's a well covered hawk watch. And the hawks come in at eye level. Uh, there's a fellow I know who's a dentist who does absolutely stunning pictures, Steve Sachs. And here's one of his peregrine shots. You can see what it was carrying for lunch. Uh, but when you get up on the ridge and the hawks are moving down, to see them at eye level is quite something. But the big story with raptors in the Hudson Valley is, is the return of the eagle. And probably a lot of you know that story, but that really marks our seasons here too. Um, because it used to be, uh, when I first moved to the county, 30 years ago now, getting a few eagles on the Christmas count was a big deal. And that's when we'd only see them in the winter. And that's completely changed around now. 
uh, and to watch them, you know, fish in the Hudson is pretty amazing. Um, when we got to 1976, our country's bicentennial, uh, there was only one eagle nest in all of New York, and the eggs were infertile from DDT. Uh, so as soon as they tried to incubate them, they crushed. Many of you know the story. But just to say how striking it is, the last breeding pair in the Hudson Valley, 1890s, and um, DDT was banned in 72. And then in 76 was this whole scheme to reintroduce eagles using eaglets from Alaska, bringing them down, imprinting them. New York did this first. 14 nest, 2060 nests, 2010. We finally had nests in the lower Hudson Valley. Um, and the last data count uh, was 2017. We're probably close to 500 now. And I know of about six, seven nests all within 25 miles of here, which is amazing to have this come back. Um, oh yes, we did say eight nests in 2021. So it's quite a story and there's a big eagle fest that happens. Uh, here's another great picture from Steve. Look in the middle there. Amazing, right? Now you guys are so familiar in uh, Florida. Uh, we've had lots of eagles. Uh, for us, they, they've kind of disappeared for a long while and now have only returned. So when there's ice in the Hudson River like this, and all the big numbers of waterfowl come down. Uh, then we have from Tappan Zee up to Peekskill, we might have 60, 70 eagles out hunting the Hudson, which is a lot for us, maybe as many as 80. And to watch them, they ride the, the ice flows up and down like commuter railroad. It's pretty funny to watch. So the other seasonal pulse that I'm watching right now uh, is our forest birds start to get together um, and uh, form this bird guild tufted titmouse, black-capped chickadee, and nuthatch start to roam around together, right, in those flocks, listening and watching with each other. Um, and with them, these year-round residents, we watch those flocks because we'll get some uh, new ones coming in that are here just for the winter, both kinglets. Uh, somebody already has ruby crown kinglet having arrived, golden crown. Uh, the hermit thrush will come down from the boreal forest and hang on the edge of these flocks. Creeper brown creeper, and then the red-breasted nuthatch, which is more of a northern bird for us. So these are kind of our winter visitors that hang out. And of course, last year, I'm not, I think you had some of this too, I'd love to hear, we had that big finch in, in, incursion. And we have lots of house finches here um, year-round, but they were joined by the more northern uh, purple finch. Here's a male house finch there. More northern purple finches at all of our feeders this past winter. It's quite something. Plus, I actually had evening grosbeak at my feeder, which I haven't had in 30 years. Big northern finch. Um, siskins, we usually get most years if we have thistle out. Uh, and then uh, red poles, both kinds uh, we had at our thistle feeders. Uh, they're not very common. Every five years or so, we'll get red poles. Grosbeak, as I said, is very rare. So those were interesting winter birds. And then um, just coming the circle here of what we're expecting, um, it's said to be, you know, these come in cycles. Um, we always have some snowy owls on the dunes out on Long Island uh, or in the grasslands uh, over in Orange County, which is uh, west of here, about an hour. Um, Orange County, New York uh, has some great grasslands where there might be a snowy owl. Um, and this big northern beautio, the, the rough-legged hawk. So two winter raptors I love to look for. Uh, and every once in a while, you know, we get a, a boom year of snowies, and, and they're talking that this might be that this winter. And I know the last boom year, we actually had a snowy make it all the way down to Florida, didn't we? I don't think it did well, uh, but I remember seeing a report on that. Um, so interesting, uh, two years ago, I was leading a group of young birders, a young birder walk at Croton Point on Christmas Day, uh, of all things. It, how that happened is another story. But we were out there on Christmas Day and there was a snowy owl. Didn't stay long, about an hour in the grasslands. But that was quite a quite a Christmas present. Not often seen at all. Rough-legged hawks we get most winters in our grasslands here. So here's another look at um, what we're watching now, which is that waterfowl movement. And again, uh, the bar charts in eBird can be so helpful just to get the pulse of birds in any area. And you can see that a lot of these birds uh, arrive in the fall, right, and stay through the winter. 
That's what this chart is showing you. Summer year-round, obviously, black duck mallard. But others arrive in the fall, stay through the winter, and then leave, you know, April or so. Do you see that? And some really neat ducks, too. Uh, a lot of uh, both dabbling ducks, beautiful. I'm looking for um, somebody just north of me had the first uh, teal coming down, which is great. Don't get blue wing teal so much on the Hudson, more out in the salt water, but green wing teal coming down and gadwall numbers. Uh, and then, as I said, we look for uh, bufflehead and uh, later in October. And this is one of my favorite diving ducks. We do get some rafts of canvas back on the Hudson. That's really a beautiful, beautiful. I think that's the largest diving duck, too. It's really quite something to see. And some name reminders, because I know some folks really like to have names next to the birds, yeah? Really lovely. Of course, they'll be in their real finery this fall once they get done with their eclipse plumage. So just to think about that, again, we to look to um, look to eBird a lot to think about some of the big hot spots just in this county uh, for the lower Hudson. Um, and you'll see a lot of them are associated with uh, the waterways. Marshlands Conservancy, uh, our number one hot spot, is on the Long Island Sound. Um, it's an amazing, it'd probably be worth millions and millions of dollars, that land. It's a county park and with lots and lots of Long Island shoreline. And if you get out there and look at into, the, into this uh, alcove near Rye Harbor from this property, you're looking over it at houses that are worth a lot of money. Uh, but this land belongs to all of us, and it's great for birding, Marshlands Conservancy. And then the other side of the county, I already mentioned Croton Point Park, that's on the Hudson. Uh, just making a point here, these top hotspots, Edith Reed Sanctuary is also on the Sound in Rye. Uh, Rockland, uh, excuse me, Rockefeller State Park Preserve is part of uh, uh, hundreds of acres that were donated by the Rockefeller family on a hillside overlooking the Hudson River. So it's back on the western side of the county, and it's really pretty amazing intact forest and so on. You can go down the list and, and see their uh, either big forested parcels on the Hudson or on the Long Island Sound uh, that gets us our um, hot spots. One exception down here is a farm that's owned by the county. It's called Muscoot Farm and it has some grasslands and fields and we do a bird walk there about once a month because it, it always has good good open country birds. So I hope many of you know uh, how to hit explore uh, in uh, eBird and uh, check out county listings. Uh, hit explore, hit explore reason, and type in any county name and really get a, a wealth of information including birding data up to the last hour, uh, assuming people have entered it. And I just want to make another shout out here that it's really good when I'm eBirding not just to take the default setting in the mobile app, which is what it will do unless I change it, but if I'm in a hotspot, to make sure my list goes into that hotspot. And I'll tell you how that's made a difference here in just a moment in our county. Um, and here's a close-up, I actually should have brought that up earlier, of all those different. But you can get a sense of the, the number of species ever seen. Uh, it's not staggering, but it's not bad. Um, but marshlands is far and away got the most birds. A lot of rarities have shown up along the coast there at Marshlands, including a wood sandpiper once. We're hoping our first New York limpkin shows up there. We, we need a limpkin. You've got limpkins? We don't have one on our state list yet. We did have this year, though, uh, not in Westchester, but in the lower Hudson. We had uh, one of those wandering roseate spoonbills and wood stork, two birds that should be down with you, kind of wandered up here and uh, thrilled birders for a few days. Interesting. Uh, so here's uh, why eBird made a difference. These are some folks from our Audubon chapter on the side of that capped landfill grassland at uh, Croton Point Park. And we got some signs put up as well. Uh, because we had eBird data for Croton Point, uh, we were able to point to that to uh, help encourage the county park uh, department to manage this grassland better. When this landfill was first capped, the idea was just to have mown lawn. Uh, and Audubon and others were able to point to even Christmas bird count data at that point 
to push against that idea. And now we can point to our eBird data to say that there's meadow larks, there's bobolinks, there's grasshopper sparrows, and now dick thistles that are using this grassland if it's if it's managed well, right? So eBird data really makes a difference for birds. Um, and sharing that data, encouraging all the different uh, Audubon groups to work together on that. Right now we're in the year two, we're just finishing year two of a New York Breeding Bird Atlas. And that's taking a big cooperation from a lot of different birders, bird clubs, and Audubon groups. So I just want to give a shout out for a couple of things that even uh, though you're not in New York might be of interest to you. If you're interested to learn more about all those hawk watches and uh, the data they collect and what they've been seeing. Uh, this is actually the 50th anniversary year for a consortium of hawk watches called um, Northeast Hawk Watch. Uh, so you can go to our website, Samuel River Audubon, and, and link into this, but it's going to be an amazing uh, Zoom event they're holding at the end of August. I think somebody else needs to be muted there too. Um, and then another big event that anybody is welcome to come to is all 12, all 12, uh, not all 12, but 12 libraries in our um, county have went together to pay for uh, David uh, Sibley to do a live Zoom. And then our Audubon chapters are all helping to promote it. And that might be of interest to some of you too. And you just go to our website. Anybody can jump onto that. Be interested to see what he talks about. If that'd be interesting presentation to book elsewhere too. Uh, and I thought I would just share these as I uh, come into sort of a finish here. Um, and glad to make some other points too after the slides end. Uh, so this is from Cape May, New Jersey. It's just a, a picture of how a lot of us came through, uh, are coming through, because it's not done, this pandemic. Uh, and I liked how they used uh, gulls here with masks on them to make their point. And then I'm sure many of you saw this one. We use this on almost every bird chat through the pandemic. And now we need to bring it out again, right? Because we're not done um, to come through this time, but bring some bird humor to it as well. Um, so that's those are some of the images I brought with you today, but I'd love to have now go into more of a, um, a conversation and an exchange and question, talking about migration, talking about the movement of birds. Um, so let me do this. I'm going to, boom, I'm going to stop that share um, and um, say hello and ask for any questions and comments. And I can add some more thoughts here too that I have queued up. Thank you. That was really, really great. You can either put your questions in the chat or um, if you like, unmute yourself. So one of the things I, I uh, got a chance to do, our chapter got a chance to do, is we did a field, uh, we did a, a multi-day trip up to Quebec to the Gaspé Peninsula. Now, if you, some of you know that there's a national park up there, Gaspésie, and uh, Bonaventure Island is off there too with the Gannett colony. The reason I mention that is for us to go up and see where some of these warblers were nesting. We always see them in the fall and the spring, pass through New York. And of course, you see them come down to you, some to spend the winter in Florida, and some to, to make that jump down the islands to Central South America. Uh, but it was interesting for us to go up further north and see where they, where they nested. Um, and even into the Adirondacks, which uh, the Adirondack Mountains are about uh, three, four hours north of me. That's how far, up to northern New York. And there are um, boreal forests there. so. Some of those boreal forest birds nest there um, and then travel up and down the Hudson River as well. So that's big fun. Um, other thoughts or questions? I have a question. Your spring migration, how did you find it this year? Was it a, a typical or was it less? Or It seemed to be very uh, spread out. It was kind of weird. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we had we had some storms that interrupted it, right? With all these different weather patterns, and so it felt like it was kind of broken up and scattered. Uh, we did have some of the usual pulses of um, good days of a lot of birds moving at once. Um, uh, 
Uh, in terms of numbers, I don't know. It's, it's really easy for me to look back, as many of us can, 20, 30 years and remember so many more warblers and uh, neotropical migrants. I mean, we, we all know about the three billion birds gone, right? You'll know about that website. And uh, so there is a loss on that. So that's the bigger picture if you're comparing one spring to another. I don't know if that answers your question. It's sort of in a just depressing way too. Somebody asked, <laughs> sorry, but it's, it's tough. Stuff out there for birds. Somebody was asking about bed and breakfast. Um, yeah, you might do better with Verbo, VRBO. Um, not a lot of bed. It's just it's an expensive area. Um, uh, I mean, I live here because I live on one of the sanctuaries that Audubon Chapter owns, for whom I work. Uh, there, there are some different areas to stay. Uh, the further you get from New York City, the cheaper it is. Uh, the exception being, if you're going from New York City out on Long Island, it gets more expensive further east you go on Long Island. <laughs> so, because you're getting out towards the Hamptons and very stratified air. So, um, yeah. Um, but if you go across the river, the west side of the Hudson, you can find some more inexpensive places to stay, or north. Get 40 or so miles north of New York City, do better. Hope that's helpful. Or Jersey. Stay in North Jersey. Yeah. Um, so what I didn't talk about is if you fly into New York and you have access to a card, I didn't talk about Jamaica Bay, which is absolutely stellar wildlife refuge. Um, oh, Lewis, cool. You're going to be in bed for next week. I'll, I'll touch that in a second. Um, right, uh, right, next to Jamaica, uh, right next to JFK Airport, across the harbor is Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. It's the only wildlife refuge in the park system, so they don't always manage it well. But uh, this year they've actually got the water levels right. There was a shorebird festival there last Saturday I was at, and just really fantastic shorebird concentration there. Uh, and then it's very good in the spring too. So um, that's if you're ever in the New York City metro area and have access to a car, there is actually public transportation that goes right down to Broad Channel, too. So check that out, Jamaica Bay. It sounds funny, but that's what it's called, Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. Excellent birding spot. So um, somebody was asking, uh, thank you, Greg. That's excellent to say, Greg, fellow New Yorker. If you're visiting New York City, you can also take a train from Manhattan. I was talking to some people earlier about the Hudson Line. So from Grand Central, you take the Hudson Line Metro North commuter rail right to Croton Point. And that's, that's a lovely walk there. It's just uh, maybe a third of a mile uh, into the park and uh, out to the peninsula. Yeah, Sandy Hook, uh, I wish I went there more. Deborah Green is asking. And you really can see Sandy Hook if you ever fly into New York City because you seem to circle it over two or three times before they let you land, right? Uh, Sandy Hook is that curl in the northeast corner of New Jersey guarding the southern part of the New York Harbor. And absolutely great birds. But it's a pain to drive to. From where I live, north of the city, you've got to drive down and then thread your way. I don't mind driving in the city. I'm, I'm calm with that. North Jersey, I hate driving in. you got to go way down and way across North Jersey to get to Sandy Hook. But it's good birds. And I get there maybe once a year. Yeah, that's another very good spot. Uh, but somebody was asking about being in bed for next week, visiting my daughter. Suggestions, an event, what about Sawmill Sanctuary? Yeah, we have eight sanctuaries. They're all very small. Um, go to sawmillriverautobahn.org. Also go to bedfordautobahn.org. Because there's a whole other Audubon chapter in the northeast corner. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing their banding, Lewis. Um, they might be done with their map study now, but they were doing banding. So check their calendar, check our calendar. Unfortunately, we don't have open bird walks now because of the pandemic, so everything's by registration. Um, people change last minute, so we have a waiting list we draw from. Uh, we usually have one or two walks a week, limited to 16 people now, and then um, we ask you to sign up in advance. It's kind of a pain. Um, yeah. But there might be some. Migration trap thing. Uh, can you explain the migration trap thing? Right. Like um, Kate May. Oh, right. Good point. Yeah. So birds are trucking down the, they're following the, the Atlantic coast. 
And as they follow that in New Jersey, all of a sudden they come to a peninsula. The same thing happens on the Hudson. And they bottleneck uh, the pause before they go across the Delaware Bay. So you can get a real concentration of migrants uh, before water crossings. And you can see that at, in uh, different parts of the country, too, not just on the Atlantic coast. Uh, certainly, uh, the Great Lakes have that on both shorelines, depending on the season. And it's it's fascinating, right? The biggest week in birding, you know, they're coming across there in Ohio. I don't know if anybody's ever gone to that. That's pretty cool uh, on the lake there. And then Central Park. Well, uh, question mark, question mark, question mark. Yes, uh, Central Park is fantastic. Uh, we We have a great deal of resentment here about Central Park. <laughs> because they get all the birds and easy to see birds because it's this green oasis right in the middle of New York City and so the birds drop there and concentrate there um, and so you can see birds sometimes up close the warblers are fantastic the fall migration is fantastic um, and um, good to go with a group and there's a lot of different groups don't go with birding Bob I'm just gonna put that out there He's a commercial tour operator that blasts songs at high volume uh, during the whole walk and drives other birders crazy, so we blacklist him. But you can go with lots of other cool people, including New York City Audubon, American Museum of Natural History has walks, and that's a good thing to do in Central Park. Um, and there's good birds. Um, yeah, I probably shouldn't slam Bob, but he's a bad guy. Oh, uh, you can Google him and see a recent article. Birding Bob. Uh, other questions or comments? Yeah. It's so interesting for us. I, I'm always looking at eBird um, to see where the birds are moving. And it's fascinating in both the fall to watch the front of birds. Like we'll see a bird arrive here and I'll look over to Pennsylvania and Ohio, or I'll look east to Connecticut eBirds, and I'll see that this particular bird has made it south on the same day across four states. And the same thing happens going north. It's just this front of birds, and, and that's the continent-wide tracking of birds made possible by eBird List. I think it's just fantastic. Uh, somebody said they saw a news piece about New York City skyscrapers shutting their lights off. Yeah, that is a fantastic effort from New York City Audubon. Um, so the twin pillars of light that go up uh, every 9-11 into the sky uh, as a memorial for where the Twin Towers were, um, those lights shoot up into the sky in the middle of September, which is peak migration. And so what happens, you have people from New York City lying on their backs on the sidewalk under the lights and using their bends. And once the number of birds caught in the lights going round and round reaches a certain level, uh, they, have short, they call in and the lights are shut off 10, 20, maybe 30 seconds, maybe as full as a minute until the birds disperse. And then they put the lights back on. And they uh, are trying some other measures as well. Uh, New York City passed a bird safe glass building law, which was amazing. And a lot of young birders actually advocated for that. I think that's two years ago now. Of course, it's not retroactive, but it's something. And it's making a difference for the kind of glass that, that isn't reflective and doesn't result in a pile of bodies on the sidewalk after a spring migration night. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Other thoughts or comments? Questions? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, how birds tie us together with the seasons across the continent? Um, especially in these weird times, to get outside and, and watch, uh, watch the migration flow and be charmed and soothed by, by birds and habitats, I think, is uh, wonderful. And I'm glad you guys are enjoying that where you are as well. It's really good. Yeah, as long as we get through this fall, I was telling some of your colleagues here at this, before the walk that we, we do school programs and field trips with our educators and we just learned today that none of the schools are doing in-person field trips through till the end of October anyway.
kind of wiped out our fall schedule <laughs> for school field trips. But we've got an incredibly high transmission happening here too. So we'll see what the fall brings us in terms of group programs. Hey, you're welcome, Deb. Thanks for the thanks. All good. Yeah, so wherever I travel, we do trips for the chapter. We decide to go different places as a group. And I always, uh, we actually managed to pull off a trip that was postponed. We went out to Yellowstone in May. And as some of you mentioned about your Arizona trip, the flight was the most nerve wracking part, but it was okay. Uh, and when we got out there, uh, as I do for all our trips, we hooked up with Sacagawea Audubon in Bozeman. And so we went out birding with them one day and then made a donation to their chapter for taking our group out birding. And that's really neat, that network of Audubon chapters and helping each other. Oh, thank you from Nashville. Hey, Jody. <laughs> that's cool. That's fun. All good. Yeah, we'd love to have you come down here. I think that would be great. We talked about doing a Florida trip. Um, we haven't, we actually were going to do a trip this fall somewhere and we, uh, we, we stuck a pin in that because it, you know, the way things were going and it wasn't going to be a big trip, uh, uh, actually up to the, um, finger. Oh, like one drink came in. I could have one if you had one more. Oh, there's somebody. Sure do that. There you go, Jody. Um, so yeah. Um, Oh, hey, thanks for New Paltz. Sarah, another New Yorker. <laughs> That's fun. Come on our regular bird chats. So or maybe you do. That's how you knew about this. Cool. Uh, or come back down to these folks, have their bird chat too. Ours is uh, right now second and fourth Tuesday. We'll see if we stick with that. Uh, other comments and questions? Yeah, this has been very informative. It's, it is so much fun to hear about the birds that we share and the ones that we don't No, very interesting i was jealous of your uh yellow-throated warbler we're just a little too far north for them uh just a handful of records lower hudson but you know we just have to drive about an hour south into northern new jersey and there they are uh, so they may, they may be one that does a range expansion, which we'd be happy about. We actually, uh, had a prothonotary and did backflips. You know, it showed up on this little park along the Hudson and we we're like, well, a prothonotary! People are running around in circles with their hair on fire, you know, because we, we just, we don't get prothonotaries. Um, uh, but we'd like to. A friend of mine says, maybe we could put up nest boxes for them. I'm like, we've only had two sightings. <laughs> He's like, well, maybe they'll move in, you know? <laughs> I don't know. That's going to work. Who knows? They are beautiful. They are gorgeous. They're a real jewel of a bird. Right. We will see. Yeah, so I'm looking forward. Um, so we're thinking of doing a trip to Florida. Probably won't be this spring. Might be the following spring. Um, and so we should coordinate on that. That would be very cool. Have yeah. a small group come there. And vice versa. If you guys uh, did a trip... Um, probably uh, two peak times are uh, either mid-May or early October uh, for birding here. Ooh, early um, October. Yeah. So that'd be that'd be kind of cool. Oh, and and then we'd probably catch a little bit of the the leaves, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The the fall color is is quite good. Yeah, um, you, you do know about the, our festival in December now. Or it's December 2nd through um, 6th. Oh, tell about that. Yeah, tell, tell your folks. Um, um, it, it highlights the Lake Apopka North Shore, which is the top eBird hotspot in Florida right now, and it's in our backyard, so we are watching out for it. Um, and so this is the sixth year of this festival. It's as small as festivals go and inexpensive as festivals go, but we have uh, great and enthusiastic leaders and uh, some good, good birding. So what do you call it? The North Shore Birding Festival. Cool. The North Shore of Lake Apopka. Yeah. It's 
which is a lake that's undergoing restoration. Um, uh, restoration and getting out invasive plants or water flow over, or yeah. over nutri nutrified ah, from yeah. farms that were uh, on its north shore. Yeah. Oh, look at oh, so that's your that's your IBI IBA there. It's our uh, IBA. Like a, mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. But cool. Ebird is the top hotspot too. Oh, very nice. It's uh, the top eBird hotspot for all of Florida. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> right now, if you're going to come in spring, um, you've got to go to the Gulf Coast where the you might get a fallout um, Fort DeSoto Park in Saras uh, St. Pete. Oh. It's uh, the hot spot there. But, you know, would you drive or um, fly? No idea. Uh-huh. <laughs> haven't gotten that far. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we're about we'd have a car. Anyway, if we flew in, we'd rent cars, and yeah, we're about a hundred miles from the, the coast. Oh, interesting. Well, this looks very cool. Your festival. Yeah, yeah please pass the word. Maybe some people would want to. And look at all your sponsors, man. You guys, you guys are doing top drawer here. Isn't Red Star birding good? We really like them now too. Especially yeah. The others. Yeah. Yeah, you've lined up cool things there. Wow. That's still last year's schedule. We're working on it right now. Well, now, if everybody could get their COVID duckies in a row, maybe we could travel in December right now. <laughs> <We're> just... yeah, <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay. We'll see. That would be nice. I hope you get it. I'm sure you'll get a... You're, you're going to be in person. Yes? Yes. Oh, it's in person. We did it last year in person, too. Just very small trips. Yeah. And uh, it's outside, and so, yeah. And the weather is usually very nice in December here. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's very neat. Hey, Ann, I wanted to ask, have you ever had Scott Widensaw talk to your group? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a very dynamic presenter, yeah. I actually ate goose with him. One of my first internships was at Hawk Mountain, and he was staying there, actually dating somebody, one of the other interns at the time. And so he had us to dinner for a goose that he shot. It's my first time eating wild goose. I wasn't pleased, and there was shot in it. I was just trying to subtly get out of my mouth and put it in my napkin. <laughs> but he's a neat guy. I hadn't hold against him. Um, but amazing, right? Speaker and writer. Um, writer. Oh, my goodness. And, and yes, we haven't heard him speak on the new book, but 20 years ago on the, on the first book, a fantastic speaker. Yeah, he's lined up, I think, to talk. We have a New York State Ornithological Association, kind of a statewide, you know, record-keeping group. And uh, for our 2022 gathering, he's lined up as a keynote, I think. Yeah, which will be very good. Yeah, that's excellent. So do you have you have him coming to the festival? What made you bring him up? Um no, he's coming um, for, as our January speaker for our chapter. Oh, well I done. Think. By Zoom or in person? Yeah, by Zoom. Not in person, no. Yeah, by Zoom. Yeah, it's easy to get some people. So somebody, uh, Deb, you're, where do you go north for shore deer dolls? Uh, Deb Devers, Devers or Devers is saying she'll be up north for shore deer dolls again this winter. Red starts here already in South Florida. Yeah, those red starts are motoring down. They really have. Um I actually had a black-throated blue female I was birding this morning at a nature preserve near here, and it, it triggered a, you know, a little hiccup in eBird because it's 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 early for us to have them moving down. But that's what it was. I wonder where she's going for. Maybe Deb was going to type there. Oh, Columbia County. Can't spell the area. Begins with oh, Shawgunk. Uh, maybe it's Shawgunk uh, Grasslands National Wildlife Refuge. Except Columbia is the other side. I don't know. Anyway, there's a really neat grassland. It used to be a uh, Air Force Base, and they, yeah, oh, good. It is. That's what she meant. And they ripped up all the runways and and changed it into a grassland. And we have uppies there. We have upland sandpipers there, and uh, it's a fantastic place. You you can. It's like drive up birding. You drive in and park facing the grasslands just before dusk. And as you sit in your car, it's usually bitterly cold too. Um, there's usually some harriers coursing around to amuse you as it gets dark slowly 
and this is a winter day, and then all of a sudden these shorties, short-eared owls rise up out of the grass like giant moths. Yeah. You know, you can have 20 or more just circling back and forth. It's, it's wonderful. It's a really neat thing to see. Yeah. And it's an easy birding trip too, because it's, you know. Oh, and golden eagles, yes. Good, well you know the areas, cool. Yeah, we actually think there are golden eagles maybe nesting in the Adirondacks and maybe nesting um, in the Mid-Hudson. But they certainly come down. There's a big shooting preserve two counties north of me in Dutchess, eh, you know, where they're releasing lots and lots of bobwhite quail and, and pheasants who have no clue how to survive. So they're all running around and being shot. And, uh, the, and then all these raptors queue up. They're like, well, this is great. <laughs> you know, there's lots for them to eat. So all kinds of eagles are there feasting on these game birds. Ethically, you know, but makes the raptors happy. Good. Cool. Well, this is fun. And I'll look forward. Yeah, we'll look forward to hearing. Um, so our next bird chat is going to be all about uh, shorebirds and waders on the Long Island Sound. A couple guys are going to do that next Tuesday. Um, Tom Burke is one of our top birders, and he's going to be talking on that. Um, and that's cool. Very good. Yeah. Nice. So all right. We really appreciate all your time. Thank you. This is fun. Sharing about your wonderful birding hotspots, and we'll do the same. I'm looking forward. This was fun. Thank you for inviting. You're very Thank welcome. you. All right. We'll say good night. Bye, everybody.